Hi, you're listening to Crime Tapes, a podcast that features crime, criminal justice um, and crime-related issues that's made in association with Staffordshire University and hosted by staff members at the School of Law, Policing and Forensics. Each week, the theme revolves around crime overall, and this week we're joined by a guest, Dan Jolly, who's a senior lecturer in psychology at Staffordshire University, and we're going to be talking about the issue of conspiracy theories. In particular, we're going to look at what constitutes conspiracy theories, um, the psychological ideas that, that inform them and the psychology behind them, and we're also going to look a little at some classic kind of conspiracy theories that have touched on crime-related issues, those both in the UK and also in the US as well. And in order to do that, we're, we're going to sort of frame some discussion about what we can know, what we can understand, and, and what it is that, that appeals about the conspiracy theory and how much conspiracy theories feature in subjects such as sociology, psychology and criminology. Um, This week I'm also joined by Kyla, as per usual, who's got quite an interesting take on on conspiracy theories too. Um, So let's start off, Dan. Can you tell us a little bit, why and how as a psychologist did you come to to look at conspiracy theories? Well, thanks for the invite to join you to talk about conspiracies. I have been interested in them for about 10 years as an academic. So yes, I am that old. To trying to understand why people believe in conspiracies and trying to understand the consequences of believing in conspiracies. Because obviously we'll talk about why people are more susceptible, of course, but it's also important to think about, okay, are they harmless? Do you believe in that Sandy Hook was a false flag, for example? Does that have any consequences? The answer I would say is yes, they do some big consequences, which we can obviously discuss. But I came to it because I was interested, interested to learn about why some people believe and why some people don't, because millions of people do believe in conspiracies, but also many people do not as well. So what's the difference? Right. OK, so, I mean, in terms of um, in terms of conspiracy theory straight away, it, it's it's a topic that in some ways sort of people wouldn't necessarily associate with with crime and criminal justice. And yet the state is very often at the centre of, of crime and criminal justice and very often at the centre of, of conspiracy theories as well, isn't it? So when you're teaching the students, what would be the sort of classic examples that you might pull out of of conspiracy theories? What are we talking about? So the examples are always based around those who are perceived to be in power. So it could be the government, but it could also be scientists, could be groups of people like Jewish people, can be those who are perceived to be in power, who are acting in secret for their own necessary gain. They're all kind of, they're engaging plots and schemes. So it could be based around Diana, for example, the idea that the UK government murdered her, the idea that climate change is a hoax because scientists are covering up their data, but also could be to do with, let's say, Sandy Hook, where it's the idea that the shootings never happened, that it was a false flag, i.e. it was all just a hoax, it was all just fake, where there were some crisis actors, so people, in essence, just acting. So there's kind of many different types of conspiracies. But as I say, it can also be about groups of people. So the idea that Jewish people are conspiring, that they're involved in plots and schemes. So it can be quite a range of different examples that some may be more harmful than others. And there's quite a long history, to I guess, to, to conspiracy theories that sort of... In some ways, I would imagine predate sort of contemporary notions. There are longer standing ones, and there are, I suppose, more outlying conspiracy theories as well, which range everything from sort of the government is picking up on your brain waves and putting on tinfoil hats and, and so on, right the way through to things that are perhaps sort of more nuanced and complex. Mm. Because certainly when we get to. Because the government will never spy on its citizens. Well, I, I think, yeah, there's... Never, uh, never do that. There, well, there is... Alexia, make me a brew. <laughs> well, there is, I, I suppose that is that is one of the difficulties in some ways, isn't it? That it, you're going to run a continuum whereby some things that, that governments do are not necessarily, you know, benign or good. They, you know, if we think about it, um, you know, there is an official secrets act for a reason, for example. You know, some things they don't want to get out. So it, it, there are those difficulties. But very often, it's not those that become the stuff of m- many of the mainstream conspiracy mm. theories, is it? Because they're not interesting, are they? But you work, conspiracies have been around for a very, very long time. They're not a new phenomenon with the internet. They've been around for thousands, if not longer. There's been research that has found that 
in the last 100 years, from 2010 onward, before that, there was letters to the editor where conspiracy theories were shown to be prominent. They were shown over those 100 years not necessarily increase, they kind of stayed steady. But that's kind of a nice example of conspiracy theories being in our consciousness, but not via our phone, social media. Of course, the internet naturally played a role. It's changed the way we talk about conspiracies. People no longer obviously write letters to the editor really anymore. It's your own blog posts, etc. But they've been around for a long time. Some theories maintain kind of interests like JFK. It's still maintained after all these years with other conspiracies pop up for one day and disappear. It can also be explained maybe by the event itself. When the event is large, people are more likely to believe it's a conspiracy because the conspiracy account is also a large event. So by saying it's the government have conspired to murder Diana, for example, as opposed to just being a drunk driver. If we think the princess has died just because it's a drunk driver, doesn't maintain personality. So people who are quite susceptible to conspiracy theories may, in the moment of learning about a missing plane, a terrorist attack, when they're feeling anxious, threatened, uncertain, may be drawn to a conspiracy. So it's not that they're paranoid or that they're wearing a tinfoil hat. Okay, paranoia is associated for some people, but it's just a normal way for us to understand the world where we feel anxious, maybe. We want to understand the, what's happened to this person, this event, and a conspiracy offers a real kind of easy answer. This is what's happened, mm. and it fits. if it fits your biases, you kind of go for it. It's interesting in a way, though, then, that... Um in some ways, the the level of conspiracy theory perhaps hasn't increased sort of exponentially at, at, at this very moment. Because, I, I mean, if you think about society today, you know, it certainly does seem to me to be characterised quite a bit at the moment, you know, mm-hmm. the contemporary world being one of anxiety, which perhaps yeah. you would yeah. sort of think would then increase yeah. people's willingness to yeah. accept conspiracy theories or perhaps to... Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, it's, there it's are interesting. Peaks, there are peaks around elections, around crisis, around obviously wars etc conspiracy theories do peak yeah. and that, that's something we can definitely say but they've been around for a long time and uh, of course they can be part of the very political process oh, as well yeah. I, 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 I would guess which is one of the reasons why the yeah. peak around election times for yeah. example because one of those that we're going to come to talk to in more more depth in the yeah. United States very much framed around an yeah. election and then it's interesting um, which bits of the conspiracy prove wrong and which bits we look at and which bits prove right because there's I guess one of the interesting things is that there must be uh, to an extent some basis mm-hmm. in fact even for mm-hmm. the conspiracy theory like you say the plane yeah. disappears yeah. Yeah. or the you, you know it's the context the, so where things have been proven to be true so Watergate and and many other different examples where we know that the government acted in secret but other events like the moon landing Chandy Hook etc are sort of acting in secret but there seem to be the conspiracy it's that that well if they covered up that what else can they cover up it's that grain of truth potentially or it could just indeed be false because all those examples have all come out they've yeah. all I think Watergate was six months for example they've always come out whereas JFK you know how many years later and it's still seen as a conspiracy so it makes me maybe feel that well, what else, what else can they do? Well, it did do take this? years for Lincoln's assassination to come to <laughs> <Yeah>. light, <laughs> yeah. to be fair. Yeah. The interesting thing, about again, isn't it, I suppose, about the, the nature of the secretive mm-hmm. state, because uh, certainly some of the things that are covered um, in topics like criminology would be um, what the state wants to keep secret. And it, it, it's interesting in a way that the, the kind of... Um, the conspiracy theory very often frames the desire of the state to keep quiet essentially um, its power or to protect powerful actors. Whereas in some ways, it's I think one of the things that's... It's a narrative as well, protecting to be narratives fair. and reputations, actually, that's more yeah. interesting as yeah. a, a part of it. Cause quite, Shaping quite often, public opinion to... Because um, we were talking earlier on about the Creel Commission, which was the propaganda surrounding the First World War in America, that before the, before they went to war um, and joined in, um, Woodrow Wilson had the stomach for it. He wanted to go to war. But at the time, the American public were not really down with that. So what they did was they, they started the Creel Commission, which was basically propaganda to get the US people to join the war. Yeah, how can this, you- yeah 
this is this this is not and if this is nothing that's been made up so w- when you look at the historical sort of events surrounding so going to war looking at uh, international uh, public sorry public relations in the US how it was set up to basically control the minds of the public looking at things like uh, Operation Mockingbird where they paid journalists to put out a certain narrative their propaganda you can see why people are distrusting mm-hmm. now I'm not saying that you know we should be looking at every single sort of, well, yes, this has got to be not true. I can understand that there is things out there that are so outlandish, so embellished. But that then discredits anybody looking at it with a critical eye because you don't want to be framed as one of those people. One of the conspiracy theorists. One of the theorists conspiracy theorists. And, and there's, a, there's, a guy, there's a guy called William Blum. He used to work for the American government, wrote loads of books, and he said, no matter how paranoid or conspiracy-minded you are, the government is actually doing worse than you can ever imagine. It's it's an interesting point. And is I it? think that's what it is. And I think that's what it is. It's the, our imagination. It's yes. our imagination. We know there's something fundamentally not right out there. So how do we make sense of it? We use our imagination. And what do we use? We use the sort of things that we see. We see things in the media. We see film. We see books. And you don't read a book and get to the end of it and go, well, yes, he was avoiding paying his taxes. Mm. No, that's not <laughs> interesting. That's not fun. You mm. need something that is outlandish, that is a bit like, whoa, crisis actors and things that keep that sort of your attention. And it's like, this is this is mm. what it is. It's got to be what it is. All right, the, cert- the fact of the matter is that the stuff that the government are doing and may be doing and could be doing could be seen as quite boring and benign, like not paying taxes, hiding money, pretending there's weapons of mass destruction, using certain weapons they shouldn't, selling things to people they shouldn't. You know, all these stuff is absolutely terrible and harmful but it's just not interesting yeah. so it's it perhaps there's that question about what gets believed and and, mm-hmm. and what doesn't but I, I i take the point perhaps we should be you know and i guess that in some ways some of the peddlers of conspiracy theories will play off that, uh, that uh, truth, uh, uh, as yeah. well um so when we look at the the big characters who are now behind them for very they make often money now, out of it. they make a huge amount of money alex um alex alex jones, jones uh, who's who's the the sort of american alt right conspiracy theorist peddler who we'll, we'll talk about in relation to sandy hook i'm i'm sure you know it it has has become for him a source of sort of huge support but fed into this narrative as well though there's uh, Dan there's quite, there's quite a sort of view of the state that is the state is bad quite often or the powerful are, are yeah. bad so yeah. it's interesting that um, it, uh, the sort of default position in a way is is one of distrust now as a psychologist do you tend to find that people divide up in some ways in that you get people who are simply um, more sort of trusting and accepting of the role of the state and those who are more sort of critical and, and you know... Yeah, absolutely. Ooh. Trust is definitely one of the fundamentals of why some may, may find conspiracy theories appealing. It's all based around motivated reasoning. So if you believe that the government is bad, conspiring in, in plots and schemes, you're going to be susceptible to look for information that supports that viewpoint. So if that's your, if that's your belief, confirmation bars will kick in, where you then ex- are exposed to information on, on, me, on the media, whether it's true or false, and as long as it meets your view of the world, or you see the world as, as, as you know, they're, they're conspiring, you're going to believe that conspiracy. And you filter out that that doesn't occur oh, well, with well. you agree, you then discredit it, or what's wrong with it, or something's bad with it, even if it's strong evidence. But for things that agree with your viewpoint, even if it's weak evidence, you take it on board. So it also relates to biases. So if you are more likely to see patterns that don't exist, so pattern agency. So you, you know, we see patterns all around us, clouds, the stars. We, you know, we can see patterns. But if it's people, a cosmic trigger. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> but some people have uh, it's term. Uh, it's come quite well, maladaptive, where they see patterns that do not exist. They see patterns in coin tosses, for example, which it does based on chance. Yeah. So coupled with your reasoning that the world's, you know, people are conspiring, that you're mistrustful, that you think big events explain big things, that you see patterns that do not exist. Maybe also you are from a disadvantaged background, you don't feel empowered, you feel threatened and uncertain because the event is quite triggering. In that moment, you're going to be more susceptible to conspiracy theories. It's also been shown to have an in-group, out-group bias, so you are more likely to believe conspiracies about the other group. So Republicans about Democrats and Democrats about Republicans. So at the time of the election, those who are in, who are in power are happy. Those who are out of power, 
think that there is a conspiracy. But as soon as the election changes, as soon as that power changes, it flips. And we're talking here, uh, and we're going to be talking about a couple of US conspiracy theories. So that Republican-Democrat yeah. divide is, is a useful Real one strong, in, in some way. Really it's, and it, it's very strong. But at the same time as well, I suppose, in terms of dividing politics left and right as well, there is also a bit of a tendency perhaps to split people down a sort of libertarian or authoritarian route. And the authoritarians, I guess, would be more willing to accept the state's actions as, no. as, as <laughs> necessary and needed, and whereas libertarians are going to sort of say what, what the state is a problem and it's going to encroach on our ability. In, in the literature, is that it's, it's two extremes. It seems to be like a U curve. The extremes of either side are more likely to believe in conspiracies. Some scholars say it's equal both both sides. Some scholars say it's actually more conservatives and more ones who are more hard hard lined. There's still work to be done. There's some. Some argue that due to this contradiction, it's because of when people are polled. If people are polled during election time, well, that's when they're going to be more kind of into their belief. So there's still work to be done to really argue whether the left is more than the right. But it does seem to be the, the, the extremes are where it lies. Those in the middle are, 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 are kind of just, mm, OK. But, Most people but it's, are, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the extremes, but obviously it's about each other, as I say. It's never about believing your own party conspiracy theories. Oh, no, no, they're not true, but the other side is true. So the middle bit, you're thinking that's more of a healthy dose of scepticism, is it? In the middle bit, so the middle are, are, are political. So it's those who are kind of a bit of both, maybe, who are not as strong on either side, not as the extremes. Um, the centrist. The said, yeah. I don't know, maybe I would as... be seen as an extreme sort of politically minded person I even have a tattoo of Lenin on my leg <laughs> yeah I don't sit there looking at every single conspiracy theory and go oh, yeah that's got to be right so I think it's, the, it's always the I'm, average it's never it's, yeah. these are polls of thousands of people yeah. so there's going to be no differences yeah. you, obviously that's that's one explanation for conspiracy beliefs but coupled with your anxiety coupled with the way you see the world it all comes together to make you maybe more susceptible I guess interestingly if we if we move on to thinking about some of the so, uh, some conspiracy theories and like I said we're going to, we're going to look specifically at, at a couple in the US um, now uh, Dan you've, you've already ma- mentioned Sandy Hook um, which was a, a very sort of profile um, school shooting and, and the sort of info wars campaign and around suggesting that that was a, a false flag o- operation, i.e. that it was staged. Now, I'm guessing that for anyone listening outside of the United States, they, they might be quite shocked to think that, that such an event could be understood in, in that way. It's, it's one... I still remember, you know, very, very high profile um, US school shooting, young victims uh, played out in a, a sort of contemporary rolling news. I, I remember actually watching um, Sandy Hook almost sort of playing out on 24 hour news at, at the time. There are people in the United States, essentially, who say that that was all being played out in, in an acted manner that the people involved were all actors, actors were including actors. the family members of those, all of the state agencies that were there. Now, we'd probably better set the scene a little bit about the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, perpetrated by a, a single gunman, a 20-year-old, Adam Lanza. It happens on the 14th of December 2012 in Connecticut. It, essentially, um, Lanza walks into an elementary school, um, as with many U.S mass shootings um he has an array of of high powered weaponry on him and he basically turns that on um first a, a teachers and and people in the halls and then random largely random students who were selected it remains um, the fourth deadliest mass shooting uh, in in the united states um it's in december in the run-up to christmas and you get this uh, horrendous um school shooting sort of played out on a bright day beamed around the world and you see the pictures as people sort of as the responders turn up and the reports are saying we're getting you know these reports happens early in the day in the united states as as well so it's sort of as the school is is starting um, um, and ultimately, um, it took a, a little while for the authorities to clear the school and, and ultimately Lanza perpetrator, um, after killing some 26 people, had, had turned a weapon on himself, shot himself in, in the school. Um, but all of this sort of plays out in the United States and there are now a, a number of people, um, quite a number of them associated with the, with the political right or the alt-right, who say... 
That just didn't happen at all, Dan. Why? So a lot of people think it didn't happen. 22% of Americans believe it was a hoax designed to undermine gun control. Another poll found that 15% of people in the USA believe that school shootings in general are just a hoax indeed to cover or trying to take away people's guns. So almost a quarter of Americans believe that that didn't happen. Didn't happen. That it's what we know as a false flag. So it's just all a hoax played out by crisis actors, they're called. So people just acting... Um, Dead shooters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Who just don't exist. They just don't exist. Those children just just do not exist. It's all just a hoax as a way to um, flag gun control and to push forward the amendments to that take guns off people. So, so they this do is... love that amendment, don't they? The Americans are they they don't want to give up their guns for uh, it, anything. So it's going back to that motivated reasoning where if you're conspiratorial minded and you are you you have guns, you are going to feel that, that, that your guns are going to be taken from you. So you're going to be more susceptible to believe that this is actually just a conspiracy where they're trying to cover up to get rid of my guns, that people are more susceptible to it. And of course this happens at a time where there are debates already around mass shootings it, in the US yeah. um, and there, there is a move, yeah. you know, you've got Virginia tech as well yeah. and, and others there's a move towards controlling weapons yeah. um you've you've got to remember i suppose the U- united states context is incredibly divided mm. on on possession of, of firearms it goes yeah. right the way back and i think yeah. in part it's also perhaps it's about the relationship of argument uh, in the u.s it, as well absolutely have you heard about the, the the there's a belief that there's containment camps in the u.s have you heard about this no, no. Apparently, we they have lots of containment camps, and um, that are being built over there. You can look it up online, and you see the, the conspiracy theory of these containment camps. They're like little pods, mm. and um, so people are starting. The, the the narrative is that the government wants to take away people's ability to defend themselves, and then the next phase of that will be these internment camps. Uh, well, it, it is it is interesting, I, and I think I, I mean something I don't, I, and I'm careful about how I, I say this, but I do think there's something interesting in 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 the American psyche in some ways that is slightly different, and and I do think there's a historical legacy to that, which is that you've got to remember that at least in part, um, the United States was populated by people who elsewhere were were this persecuted Chris, Chris um, and persecuted by authorities mm-hmm. and and so um, there's a, a very they strong... believe they were persecuted by the British as well that's how they gained uh, their abs- independence absolutely. it was more of a case that they didn't want to pay tax but... Uh, but but when you when you combine those two together you have perhaps quite a sort of uh, quite furtive ground maybe for, to believe for in paranoia and, 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 and to be very much sort of um, the extreme end of, of libertarian um, small state. I mean admittedly this is where it, the idea falls down in some ways because they can also in, embrace quite authoritarian and punitive things at times mm-hmm. so you know don't you dare try and take our death penalty would be another one but you know they, they need the state to impose that and mm-hmm. you know but but so it it can be sort of slightly contradictory. But it, there is definitely something I think that's interesting in that. And of course, the other thing about the United States is is it was founded in some ways as almost a sort of independent settler frontier land where firearms become very very important. But then and, and Michael Moore shows this sort of brilliantly in in Bowling for Columbine as well. Also based around another very real school shooting. You know that that it also becomes tied to. Um, concerns particularly um, in the defeated southern states uh, in the civil war about the threat that freed slaves may present and so far I was just, I was just going to say we're, we're, what we're talking about really is uh, that sort of like white fragile masculinity over there uh, yeah and uh, there, there is so there's there's a lot of you know there's a lot of things that become sort of interwoven together but it's somewhat incredible to think that people could believe that something on the scale of a school shooting like yeah. that would, would be fake. It's every school shooting as well. Yeah, it's every school shooting. Every absolutely. school shooting. I mean, I mean, it fits their A quarter their, their of dialogue. Americans yeah. believe mm-hmm. that this is just a fel- not true. It's, it's not all because true. they want to take away gun control. Yeah. And it's all down to the idea of if, if someone benefits from something... People are more susceptible to say, well, actually, they must have been part of this. They must have orchestrated this. But don't they think if they wanted gun control that badly, they'd just do it anyway? 
<laughs> it's arguing that it's helping their cause. It's helping mm. highlight why guns are bad. Yeah. And if you're minded that you you do have guns and you want to keep your guns and you perceive that the government is going to take them away from you, you are going to endorse this. And also, obviously, it's a big event. So naturally, you're going to think, okay, well, it can't just be a one shooter who's done all this. It has to be something larger than this. So you're already kind of susceptible to conspiratorial thinking. So in a, in a way, it, it, of, it's a, in a way, it's a, a sort of discreditation of the fact that some, a, a damaged, fragile, mm. white, you know, yeah. man can yeah. walk into a school and, oh, no, and they wouldn't do, be do yeah, anything. such things. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, and also, have you noticed, especially when, especially when you look at America, that it's really sort of racialised as well. When it is the white man going in with a gun, this is a false flag. When it's a person of colour, then this, oh yeah, that definitely happened. But when it's a white, young male, this didn't happen. And, and there's yeah, there is an interesting sort of race dynamic too. But when you said it's sort of a fragile white masculinity, I think I, I would go back with actually I think it's about fragile masculinity mm. in some ways more so than it is about the ethnicity because actually if I we look at seeing, mass shootings yeah. in the United States, you do see you know that although some commentators will say it's about white males, actually that you know the profile of those charged with four plus shootings, you know, one occurrence, is racially quite diverse, as you would expect yeah, it to be in, like in the United it's States. Just, it's just the way it's framed But then the framing is the framing isn't is different. differently. Yeah. And also, what we're seeing now, um, obviously, if we're looking at the recent ones, um, the shooting in the grocery store in America, yeah. this is racialized. This is, this is, this is white, yeah. fragile masculinity, that, which has been fostered in a really hostile environment over there. And, that brings and rather us than to, turn around and say, let's legislate guns, it's going to be computer games. Yeah, and, and, that, brings us, and it, Trump that brings us to... Trump even got the place to, wrong. That brings so. us to an interesting point, doesn't it? Because in some ways, the, it's the very people who are saying that, you know, this is a false flag operation, a denial of this, that, uh, that now, are seemingly, particularly in the at the El Paso uh, recent, mm. you know, mass shooting, seem to also be implicated as perpetrators in a way that the the yeah. in some ways the conspiracies yeah. that they're being fed about the the sort of nature of the Great Replacement, for example, yeah. or you know yeah. about how people in power are looking to sort of remove all power of white males from the United States become intertwined with with some of these yeah. conspiracy theories and they then yeah. have a, a damaging impact absolutely so, mm-hmm. because if they, if they believe that others are about to get them others being the government they're trying to take away their guns they're trying to conspire people are likely to want to actually keep back at them want to actually you know, fight back to the conspirators. So we know that those who are more likely to believe in conspiracies are more likely to accept violence towards those who they perceive to be part of the conspiracy. So it could be the government or it could be many other different groups who are perceived to be conspiring. Including those groups that would hold the alternative yeah, view would, in a way. And to be fair, I think what is what is more frightening now is that if you, you take that, 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 that narrative is that now they've got the people that would be susceptible to this now have an icon in the White House who mm. is perceived yeah. to be on their side. Yeah. So rather than looking at the state and the government to be the problem, that the dominant force in their oppression, it's now the people that the government are saying the dominant force in their uh, uh, it's the othering of mm. migrants, mm. of, um, you know, if you have a look at the whole sort of Trump's policy on immigration mm. the fact that he blamed immigration for what happened immigration the, is responsible for the crime and all these and, shootings yeah, that are build happening build a wall you know, you know so, so these it's people are really yeah. susceptible to it yeah. and then you've got somebody who's propagating this sort of narrative you got you you look at his rallies just recently and it's frightening it's this is nuremberg stuff this is disgusting behavior mm. yet people mm. and people are listening to it and going mm. yeah he yeah, wants right. me to yeah. kill these people because yeah. that's people what they're are hearing. On it. So yeah. recently on Friday, the FBI announced that conspiracy theorists are part of their terrorist... Um, I can't quite what the word is, but they, Ooh, now I'm they're getting... actually classed as part of... Part of the kind of, terrorist uh, landscape. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, they're seen as a threat right. and they've but, actually been labelled as part of groups to watch. Yeah, well, that, that, that is, brings alarm bells a little bit to me as well because how far do we go with this? Is anybody that shows any bit of scepticism all of a sudden a conspiracy theorist needs to be watched because you are not subscribing to that dominant 
hegemonic sort of narrative that the government's putting out there. I Absolutely. think we need a bit of scepticism. I'm not being funny. Otherwise, you turn into people like my mother who'll go, Jeremy Corbyn's a terrorist. <laughs> I've read the Daily Mail. I know what's going on. It's important for our, for our society that we are questioning those in authority, that yeah, we are questioning we what we're doing. It's just that there's a line which we as psychologists have this. I understand this. this line. I don't know where, where it can be it's drawn. It's the blurring of the lines it's, that worries Well, me. That's, an, that's an incredibly good question because, you know, where it can be drawn. Um, for Because, what for one, there, like I said, there's a real world implication in, in that these conspiracy theories can do damage, and more of that uh, in a second. But, but at the same time, as as you rightly say, Kylo, we, we also have to, you know, be able to criticise, critique, use our critical faculties, not yeah. believe all that we're told, because otherwise, you know, you are into that realm of well, actually, you know, Trump is fine and he's a fine and upstanding and good man yeah. who's got nothing to do Boris with will give El us Paso Brexit. because. Yeah. Because you know that that was caused by Sonic the Hedgehog, Super Mario, and yeah, Call yeah. of Duty. You know, yeah. and Especially of course that's Sonic. That's, yeah. that's that's the media narrative mm-hmm. that those powerful groups can mm-hmm. also control yeah. as well. So you know, challenging that yeah. that. But the problem is, narrative. people who have a desire for knowledge, they want to know what has happened. They they will have this desire, but they they maybe don't have the skills to actually ask those questions. Yeah. Which is just fair that those right. low in analytical thinking, critical thinking, are more likely to believe in conspiracies. So they may feel that they want to ask these questions, they want to find out the knowledge, but they're just not they're able to think through what, what they can. It could be to do with education, low low background, disadvantage, whatever the reasons. They may feel that they have the information, but they're not able to actually ask the questions. So it's a background to education, giving people the skill sets to when they actually want to find out the truth, have the skills to actually do that. Well, Although Noam Chomsky was... did say that propaganda plus education is the ultimate recipe for um, societal control. So you know, yeah, it's, it, it it brings us into incredibly. Difficult, I mean, a lot of the history that we territory. believe is based on propaganda. Things like the Huns used to rip off the arms of babies. <laughs> now that's in a history book, you know. Yeah, yeah. So. And, and that brings us to the point, in some ways, of, of thinking about the the very impact of, mm. of conspiracy theories, and particularly um, linked to crime, and particularly to, to the sort of run up because we've talked a lot of about Trump already, and particularly to to the run up to um, his election to power that that gave us the Pizzagate conspiracy. Mm. Yeah, now I'm one. guessing a, a lot of people won't, and I, indeed until I started reading for this I, I'd heard little bits about it but but hadn't necessarily recognized or got the full detail um, it was a sort of story that I think for many in the UK may have sort of flashed up on phone screens but certainly not occupied the media like it did in the United States in the aftermath and and just to sort of set the tone a little bit for this this is a this is a conspiracy theory um, that's very very tied to Washington and Washington DC and it, it links to essentially a man who was um, both a, a staffer for for Bill Clinton and then was working on the electoral campaign for Hillary Clinton um, and some material that was then put into the public realm by a woman miles away from uh, from Washington DC um, that essentially started to make allegations about a group of shadowy powerful figures including Democrats linked to the Clintons being involved in child trafficking and child sexual exploitation in and centred around a pizza restaurant Um, and the pizza restaurant um, gave essentially cover for all sorts of networks of of grim abuse that spread out throughout Washington and and involved powerful actors. Um, Ultimately, why this becomes a sort of significant um, event in the United States and in the run-up to the the hugely divisive election as well is having already spoken about mass shootings, what what ultimately happens is um, the pizza restaurant at the centre of it, which has no connection whatsoever with child porn, child abuse, um, it's not being investigated, um, is attacked by a man bearing automatic weapons. Um, So he essentially targets it. Now, Pizzagate is a kind of interesting conspiracy in that way that that links crime together with the conspiracy theory. Dan, can, can you tell us a little bit more about this conspiracy theory in particular? 
So when it's all based around those released messages, emails that came through, where people saw coded messages in these messages. Some argue that messages were indeed a bit weird anyway, but things like there was CP in there, which people read Child to porn, porn, which was, was actually... Or was it also cheese, cheese pizza? pizza. Yeah. 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 So it's these coded messages that people saw into. So if you're already predisposed potentially to be mistrustful of, of those in authority, you know, the other side of the, of the coin... You may be more susceptible to think, okay, well, what is going on? Order me four CP is yeah, it suddenly it's can become very different. Yeah. So with this chap who went in, he he read about these conspiracy theories online, and he felt empowered to want to do something. So he actually messaged his friends to say, "I need we're just going to do something. We're going to save these children." So then he went into the pizza restaurant, and he realised very quickly that this actually may just be nothing because the conspiracy was all about that these children are kept in the basement. When he arrived into the into the shop, he realised quickly the shop doesn't have a basement. <laughs> I mean, so, it does it does sort of stand against the the emerging narrative. It's a bit yeah. like you know the the the, the catacombs under Staffordshire yeah. University. Thing is, being, what you know used to didn't ha- help was the uh, the Trump campaigns lock her up, lock her up, yeah. lock her it's up. It's all fitting that narrative. It, it is. Bed. It's fitting that. But narrative. with this guy, he went in, but he still didn't shoot him. So he still shot many rounds, and I believe one actually almost missed someone's head so he mm. actually could have you know um, shot obviously the police came quite quickly and they arrested him the judge said that he had good intention because the intentions were to go and save children but it was based on a conspiracy so he obviously was arrested etc but the conspiracy still remains because conspiracy theorists argued that this guy was actually a crisis actor and that he it was all just a hoax and then the conspiracy got, got, got wider that actually it's not that shop, it's another shop with a basement, but they don't want to release that, etc. etc. So to try and keep the conspiracy as it is, it was reworked. Uh, yeah, and I think why people sort of tend to, to, to be susceptible to this is because over the years, many prominent figures have had links to child abuse. Cyril Smith was one of them. That was kind of covered so it up, wasn't the context. it? it the, the context is there. Yeah. We know, you know, since ancient yeah. Rome, those in power used yeah. to be dominant over they have the serving boys and whatever yeah. and it was part of that entitlement it's the stuff today uh, of, of debate because if we take for example Carl Beach's allegations which the Metropolitan Police said uh, were credible and supported as credible to get search warrant to sort of search Lord Bramall and Harvey Proctor um, who would had you know Beach is now in in prison for 18 years the whole story that he spun was a pack of lies it's come out in in trial you know the claims that he made including a, a friend being murdered completely spurious the police seemingly must largely have known this at the time but they still and it's interesting that even even some officials can buy into some of the conspiracy theories. So, for example, when we get to Pizzagate, um, we're not talking about it just being, although there was a, a large presence of things like um, 4chan and the retweets from Russian bots, bots promoting yeah, it, promote, yeah. but we also do have people like Roseanne Barr saying, you know, John Podessa is the advisor to, to the Clintons, you know, has been implicated in child sexual abuse in a pizza restaurant, and this is all a shadowy mm. scheme. Mm. So there, there are there are figures, including celebrities, you know, who are essentially... Well, they're still human. They're still susceptible. Well, yeah, no, yeah, of course yeah, they are. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, and, and interestingly, they were quite often at the forefront as well. Mm. So the, the way in which the conspiracy in some ways gets actioned is by getting those people because the bots are mm. essentially retweet yeah. the, 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 the significant figures that then... YouTube played a really interesting role in this case. So it, there's a video pushing this conspiracy theory at Pizzagate, before obviously the shooting at Pizzagate, and it was on the top trending on YouTube for a small period of time. So I think at one point over 250,000 people had viewed this video, which was pushing this conspiracy theory, which appeared, as I say, the top trending on YouTube. YouTube came out to say it was a mistake. Their systems noticed that there were official footage in this video, so they classified it incorrectly. So they classified it as an actual, you know, like a BBC article, for example. They classified it as something like that, which then meant the algorithm took, took into play and it put into people's recommended and appeared for a short period in, in the top-rated trending videos. 
Well, see, now they have to rework their algorithms, and I imagine that wouldn't happen again. But it opens the case of, okay, this conspiracy was pushed via YouTube's recommendations. And that's how it kind of really lighted people's fires. So what is the role of YouTube? Is it that they should totally stop allowing this kind of content on their platform? Or is it more to do with, obviously, you need to be free speech. Is it more to do with maybe they make these videos less accessible so they're there but they're not necessarily recommended because research shows that we spend hours on youtube now a, a video on youtube is usually 10 minutes long there about so if you spend an hour on youtube that's many videos that you could be exposed to and if you get into the trap of just watching the recommended videos that play automatically which I, you know, i've done myself not about conspiracies but other stuff you could be spend that whole hour just in that cycle so YouTube, I know are definitely looking into it. I have worked to try and stop that so that you're not just in this echo chamber of watching conspiracy videos. But Pizza is a really interesting one where it appeared in the top trends. And that had, and clearly it had an, an had impact because impact, you get yeah. Edgar Welsh, the, yeah. the man in question, who turns up yeah. with his automatic weapon, yeah. AR. And it only takes one person. It only takes one person, and they could have murdered a lot of people. But but like you like you say, it's 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 interesting in a way that even subsequently, you know, the narrative is still then reframed that this is a crisis crisis actor, actor. and 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 that's to do with that confirmation bias. That you know, even when you have significant people in Mm. in the FBI coming out, um, uh, you you know, the 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 impact and and the impact is quite widespread because um, interestingly, one of the, the bits that I read about it was the pizza restaurant Comet Ping mm, Pong Pete, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. or something. Actually, unfortunately, I mean, it must have been a, a, a good pizza restaurant, one would assume, because there was another pizza restaurant located three doors down from it, which was also targeted again and again and again by people sort of throwing in hate mail and mm. making menacing phone calls. Yeah. So, that, so although it's only one man who turns up to, to shoot the place up, there, there's mm. clearly businesses targeted as part of yeah. this were, were much wider there were far more people sort of threatened it did yeah. spread and take yeah. on a, a, a life of its own where people then actually feel empowered in a way to act in the real world and I guess yeah. that's one of the problems with conspiracy theories whether it be the sort of physical act of actually trying to go out and and prove mm. them in, in some way. To go and save the children. Uh, yeah, so intentions save. were good. Absolutely. And it's a rational thing to do. If you're in that mindset that you think people are conspiring, you believe that there's the, the children are in danger, for example, you are going to want to go and protect those children and yourself. So you're going to want to arm yourself. You want to go and actually go and call the conspirators to action. You're going to feel empowered to do that. It's just when it's a conspiracy and there's indeed for example no basement there's no one it's not actually happening that could lead to very you know some dangerous consequences where people go and they commit murderous acts shootings in the name of a conspiracy that is indeed just a conspiracy or, si- or simply just acts that in in and of themselves put themselves in danger i suppose as well because uh, i i guess for example you know um area, area 51, 51 if you were to try yeah. and walk into yeah. it you probably so in september find there's a facebook group of two point five million maybe even more now they can't kill people us all people want to go oh, and it can't stop us all yeah. Yeah. but you're totally right the government because it is a it is a government base they are going to protect that base so even if a handful of people go, they are likely to be met with with force, which could lead to, you know... Which is not going to do them any good when they're trying to say there's nothing there. Yeah, no. and I suppose it, it does sort of take us back to, um, to to the point at which, you know, there is, a, there is some level of actuality around some of the conspiracy theories. I, I, um, interestingly, I, uh, given we've been talking about... Uh, the context of the United States. If anyone hasn't seen it yet, Black Klansman, I saw a couple of weeks ago and I thought it was a, a, a really, really interesting, um, really interesting and good film. Um, Spike Lee doing the sort of uh, the infiltration of the Ku Klux Klan by a, a, a black uh, American police officer. And uh, it, it certainly found it very, very funny. But there's a, the, there was a great scene in it where uh, one of the, the guys who is a, a sort of Ku Klux Klansman says to, to the other, you know, um, and what about this this fake Holocaust sort of, you know, the, 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 the fakery of the Holocaust. And the other one then kind of comes back and, and dismisses the fakery of the Holocaust. How can how can you think that this is fake? You know, and it's interesting that even within these sort of organisations where there's a high degree of mistrust, there there must be 
some that are quite sceptical about the claim that such widespread events could be fake. So, so for example, when it comes to... And, and one that always jumps to my mind, the, the conspiracies are not around 9-11, for example, you know... Um, I've been to the United States. You can see that the Twin Towers aren't there anymore. The, 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 the conspiracy theory doesn't become that it didn't happen at all. It becomes that... Who did it? Who did it? Who I, did I, absolutely. It? So there's always that sort of element, perhaps, of, of an, sort of an accepted basis of, of damage. It's however, just... however, on that score, I'm just going to say it didn't harm... US intentions to carry on going to the Middle East to disable the area at the end of the day. So I can understand why people who are of that trap mind could say, well, there's more to this. Yeah. But instead of looking at it from a case of, oh, yes, it suited an agenda, maybe intelligence may not have acted as quickly as they could have done. Maybe that would be more of a, a something you could believe in. Oh, there it's can all... be human failings and human frailties yes, in yeah, organisations yeah, yeah, yeah. and systems because governments, for example, are made up of countless individuals, some of them mm-hmm. highly competent and yeah. able individuals, and Others some not. of them... Um... So it's easier to believe that it was... it was They were all trained. But the thing is, there we go again, we, you know, people say that you know these pilots were all trained by the cia well where are they getting this at? where where is this jump coming from well it's fact, not that much of a jump to it's think not that a jump the cia is it? The, the, the cia or, or indeed ex-sas men may have been at one point in the past you know training training with what well, did you remember, the does taliban. remember james bond working with the taliban that was that's one of my favorites because mm. we always talk about rambo but if you go back to the living daylights mm-hmm. you know in the living daylights um we, timothy dalton as james bond you do have james bond working with you know the mujahideen or the taliban mm. In, in Afghanistan, you know, we always do the Rambo US, work. The with them. proxy wars in, in Afghanistan, uh, you know, that did see CIA operatives going over there to train hmm. and, and people wh- to fight against the Russians, including mm-hmm. Osama bin, bin Laden. Laden. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, people will listen, to, will see that, and then go, "Well, it's a logical conclusion is that it was all fabricated." So they've, this, yeah, they've covered that. What I was going to cover exactly. It's their viewpoint. Exactly. All this cards you've talked about. It, mm-hmm. it, but it, but yeah, there's. There, I think perhaps the place that I think to, the way to fight conspiracy is for more transparency from our own upstairs. Our leadership, to be absolutely. Fair. Yeah, Leaders and who uh, make people feel empowered. Yeah, society. Uh, that's almost a good point to end on. Um, but there was one final thing I, I just wanted to mention because this was the bit of uh, the PizzaGate um, conspiracy that I thought m- m- most interesting, and it shows how I these. Things come I was together thinking, with is it the fact that um, somebody didn't want pineapple on their pizza? Uh, well, no, no, and, uh, and pineapple does have an, an absolute role. It is a food stuff, just not on pizza. No, does I it? It, it, it's, I it's not pineapple um, on pizza. Is that's life. But but uh, but one of the one of the things I found quite interesting is that um, the conspiracy has become so broad with PizzaGate that um, it even comes to encompass some people in the United States of, of America um, linking the the police sketches of the suspect involved in the Madeleine McCann abduction with John Pedessa. So they, they were actually going, well, um, John and Pedessa was behind is, the for disappearance another day. of Madeleine <laughs> McCann. I'm just going to say, so the Madeleine things, McCann thing is definitely for another day. Yeah, so how, another these, day. But how these things connect with crime is, is clearly, yeah. you know, much much broader than sometimes we uh, we, we necessarily think about. And uh, yeah, uh, Madeleine McCann is definitely for another day and, and gives rise to perhaps the, the, the subject I think in the United Kingdom that I find polarizes more people in in private mm-hmm. than any any other. Um, so uh, yeah, perhaps that is one we we should come back to, Carla. Um, but no, a- absolutely fascinating discussion. So uh, all that sort of remains for me is to just thank Dan, senior lecturer in, in psychology at Staffordshire University, for coming and, and helping us talk through some uh, interesting conspiracy theories. Also to say thanks to Kyla, um, who, like I say, she's she's got some interesting views on on conspiracy <laughs> theories, and we didn't even get into the likes of Northwoods or the causing of the the Vietnam War. Um, but yeah. uh, but but again, perhaps, uh, perhaps another day. Another day. Um, Maybe we can do one where where we can look at those conspiracy theories that were proven to be 
not conspiracy theories. Yeah, that, 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 that might be a that, good one. That would be um, a good one, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Or indeed, you know, I think perhaps we're looking at the secrets of the state might be mm-hmm. might be another one. Um, yeah. Policing and the secret state. But uh, no, th- thank you both for what was a really uh, fascinating and interesting discussion uh, for me as well. And also to thank Adam Buckridge for producing the music for the podcast and to say look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of Crime Tape. Crime Tapes couldn't happen without the remarkable students and staff in the Staffordshire University School of Law, Policing and Forensics. If you're interested in finding out more about a future in crime prevention and investigation, education is your next step. Make sure you get a good start by visiting University Open Days before you make any decisions. Staffordshire University's next Open Day is on the Saturday, the 28th of September, where you can meet our team of experts, tour campus facilities, explore new and exciting courses, and find out everything you need to know about higher education.